Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Stay at Home series. Uh, my name is Bhaskar Prusankara. I'm the editor and publisher of Jackman Magazine. And almost every day, I've been joined by a left-wing thinker who has been lecturing on an idea for around 30 minutes. And then we've been having a Q&A with our live audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, make sure you're logged into either Facebook or YouTube and put them in the chat. Uh, I'll probably give a small preference to the to the one on YouTube just because they're easier to sort through. Um, but please do um, log on. Um, we've been doing this series for around six weeks or so. Uh, all along the way, we've been getting the help of our producer, Kale Brooks, and a lot of other people. And it's been a big success. You know, we've probably, we've taken Jacobin's YouTube audience from maybe a few hundred people to, uh, I think, well over 23, 24,000 uh, subscribers at this point. Our only ask is a completely non-monetary one. We want you to press like, press subscribe on the videos. We want you to share them with your, your friends. Uh, that's it. You know, We'll do some fundraising in December, but until then, uh, that's our only ask. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Vivek Chibber. And Vivek is a professor of sociology at New York University. He's also the editor of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy, Jacobin's sister, publication, which is a really incredible scholarly uh, journal. I say scholarly and not academic because the authors and catalysts strive for accessibility. They strive to be relevant to many of the most important debates about capitalism and about social strategy today. And we're just finalizing our next edition of Catalyst, which features a really interesting piece by John Romer, as well as many other uh, contributions. So it's definitely worth uh, checking out. Vivek is also the author of Locked in Place and Postcolonial Theory in the Specter of Capital. Most importantly, he's the author of three incredible pamphlets, The ABCs of Capitalism. And I say that because we are now releasing those completely for free online. All you have to do is go to bit.ly dash or slash ABCs of capitalism. So bit.ly slash ABCs of capitalism, all in lowercase, and you'll be able to download a copy of those pamphlets. We still have a few in print as well. On um, Monday, we were joined by, by Vivek as well, and he gave the beginning of his, uh, his, his lecture, uh, Understanding Capitalism. And today, he'll be continuing on and he'll be finishing on Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, so please do tune in, tune in then. Today, he'll be focusing on questions of capitalism and the state. And uh, Vivek will go ahead for, for 30 minutes. In the meantime, uh, please do think about questions as he's speaking, put them in the chat, and press like and press subscribe on the video. But without further ado, please go ahead, Vivek, and thank you so much for, for spending all the time putting these together and for joining us today. Thank you, Bhaskar. And uh, Kale Brooks, who's doing this fantastic job producing this and uh, making sh sure it gets online smoothly. So Kale, uh, thanks to you too. Today's lecture um, is on the state, which in many ways is the simplest and easiest of all the theoretical issues for people on the left, because what is uh, confusing and mystifying to uh, the intelligentsia, to politicians, to people who were immersed in mass media and in the middle class is actually is not only obvious to socialists or to the left today, but has been over the course of its life, which is now over 150 years or so. Much of what I'm gonna to say today comes directly out of the political practice and the political experience of working class movement, peasant movements, and movements that are in some way taking on the power of capital, both in the North and the South. Now, because it's a kind of a, in my view, much simpler topic, what I'm hoping to do is get through it a little bit more expeditiously, and perhaps that'll give us more time for questions and answers, which I think is going to be the most lively part of something like this. And there's hopefully enough of you out there that it'll also make it uh, more interesting for you. So when I say this is the least complicated issue, what is the issue that I'm saying is so easy to understand? 
it's basically this. Remember from the last lecture I gave, I said that capitalism has two very important characteristics. One is that it produces massive inequalities, massive differences in wealth and in income. Uh, capitalists on the one side controlling all the resources of society and uh, amassing great profits for themselves and the working class on the other, which is both experiencing enormous insecurity in its access to employment, but also insecurity in its, able, in its ability to reproduce itself. Now, married to this is the fact, the uh, second fact, which is that capitalists use their power to preserve and reproduce that dominance over the poor. So, and this is where the socialist and the left tradition uh, diverges from the liberal tradition. Liberals also recognize that capitalism and markets produce inequalities systematically. They also recognize that the inequalities are not just because of the failings or the particular attributes of individuals, but they're institutionally and socially created. But where the difference is, is that Marxists and the socialists have always said, it's not just that it's society that's producing this, but it's particular groups in society who both benefit from and sustain those inequalities. And that's why the poor and the rich are locked together in a battle where the wealth of one is coming at the expense of the poverty of the other. And the poverty of one is maintained because wealth is being amassed on the other side. All right, now these are the two main characteristics that the left has always recognized as being essential about capital. And that raises the next question, which is there is a second source, a second uh, pillar of power in capitalism, which is the state. And the question is, if there are these enormous inequalities that are being sustained and maintained by capitalists, who use their power to squeeze the working class, why doesn't the state intervene on the side of capital? Or at the very least, could the state, sorry, I said capital, on the, on the side of labor, at the very least, could the state be an actor that reverses or at least neutralizes all of the inequities that we see in society? That's the question which for hundreds of years now, political theorists have wrestled with. And for the left, the answer has always been, no, it's not going to do that. In fact, it is everywhere and always tending to intervene on the side of the wealthy, on the side of the powerful. And the challenge for the left has been to explain why. Now, as challenges go, it's pretty simple. Uh, rich people control all the money and because they have all the money, they can also wield a lot of influence. It's for the mainstream, for academics, for uh, the people in the middle strata of society who don't encounter the weight and the power of capital on a daily basis. It's for them harder to understand why the state cannot be neutral. So what the socialist or Marxist theory of the state is doing really is trying to present systematically and logically and in a consistent way the essence of what their own experience has re revealed to them about the, what we say, the class character of the state. So while it is a simple matter in terms of knowing what the truth is, the challenge for the left is to present it systematically, coherently, in a way that not only exposes the bias of the state, but also does it in a way that's persuasive and that's logically coherent. So that's our challenge for today. I doubt I'm going to be saying very much that all of you don't already know. It's really just an exercise where we can all make sure that we're all anchored in the same assumptions and the same understanding so that we can then have a really important discussion, which will come next in the next lecture, which is one of strategy and how you get there from here, knowing how power is constituted and situated within capitalism. Well, the, there is a theory that we're up against. It's a theory which is not articulated very explicitly or carefully these days. It was once the reigning doctrine within political science. Uh, today, I would say it's still probably the dominant view of the state within political science, within sociology, and certainly within economics. Uh, and it is also propagated assiduously, both by politicians, understandably, also by the media. And that theory of the state is, has been known traditionally as a pluralist version of the state. Now, the pluralist understanding of the state 
pretty much flows from this label that we've given it of pluralism. It suggests that there is a plurality of power sources and a plurality of interests within capitalism, all of whom try through the democratic process to gain access and wield influence within the state. So what are these, what is this plurality of interests? It's any group of people that organize themselves, bring themselves together around a particular goal or a particular interest that they're trying to advance. Of course, capitalists are one such interest group. Of course, workers, labor is another such interest group. But there's many others. There's women, there's minorities, there's religious groups, there's demographic groups like old people and young people, there's ethnic groupings, any one of them. And of course, it's true that in politics, we find people coming together along these axes and along these identities all the time to try to influence social policy and social legislation. Empirically, there is no denying this basic fact that pluralism observes. But what makes the theory go is not the recognition of this fact, but a stronger theoretical claim that they make, which is that not only are there all these different interest groups, this plurality of groupings that buy for power and influence, but no one grouping is any more powerful than the other. So there is not, it's not so much that this is a capitalist society, because a modern society, which because it's democratically organized now, in that modern society, you have interest group competition in which any one interest group has the capacity to win out over the other. Now the key point here then is that whatever's going on in the economy does not directly affect the distribution of political power. The distribution of political power has to go through a firewall that separates the economy from politics. What is that firewall? The right to vote. It may be the case that dollars are distributed very, very unequally in the economy. But in order to get elected, it's not the dollar that gets you into office, it's how many votes you can accumulate. And no matter how, no matter how many dollars you have, you still have only one vote. So the famous saying, a Rockefeller might have hundreds of millions of dollars, but he has still the same number of votes that his employees have, which neutralizes whatever economic advantage he might have. Politicians, because they're in the business of trying to amass the largest number of votes, it, it looks like we they might have. Uh, therefore, do they look at how many? Looks like we just lost Vivek for one second. Vivek, your connection is restabilizing now. So I think you should be fine to maybe just go back 10 or 15 seconds and just repeat your, your little point there. Uh, then uh, we'll, be, we'll be all set. So you don't have to go back that far, maybe 10 I seconds. I only have little points. I don't have any big points. So you'll have to be more specific as to which little points you wanted me to repeat. Well, whatever the hell you were saying before you sounded like a robot. All right, well, <laughs> go, go you know, that was, I wasn't even listening or paying attention to myself, so I have to go back and listen. What I was saying is the pluralist contention is that even though a Rockefeller might have hundreds of millions of dollars while his employees only have one, they still only each have one vote. And in politics, what matters is how many votes you amass as a candidate, not how many dollars there are out there in society that you might seek to track. That's what that means then is pluralists go not to where the money, sorry, politicians go not to where the money is, but to where the largest number of votes. And so the competition over votes cancels out economic inequalities and whatever advantages the rich might have in the economy. That's the basic view. So this then means that a democratic society is one in which the state can, in fact, intervene on the side of the poor if the poor manage to present their views, to present their interests in a way that persuades a lot of people, that brings politicians over to their side, et cetera, et cetera. The gist of this then is that the state in principle is a neutral actor. In principle, that is to say, in the scheme of things, there's no particular reason why politicians will come down on one side or the other consistently and repeatedly. It all depends on how effective and how persuasive the people in society are 
in constituting themselves in large numbers and bringing those large numbers to the ballot box. All right, now, this is the understanding that all politicians peddle when they go out there and they say, hey, I'm just a servant of what the people want. I follow public opinion. If public opinion goes this way, that means all the votes are going this way. That's where I'm gonna go. It follows from that, if that premise is true, and whatever politicians are doing must be because it's what the public wants. And understand that this has been the single most effective counter to the left when people on the left say, Americans need single payer, Americans need free childcare, Americans need to do something uh, about uh, the enormous inequalities. What politicians turn around and say is, we don't pursue single payer because we're doing what the public has wanted us to do. Americans are fearful of big government. Single payer is big government. Americans are individualistic, rugged. They don't like handouts. Americans don't like charity, blah, blah, blah. What's the evidence of that? Well, it's the fact that we're in office and we're doing what we're doing. It must be because that's what the public wants. For decades, this assumption is what's so powerful amongst intellectuals, the middle class that votes, the politicians and the media that it was never questioned. Even though what polling data there was from the 80s and 90s onward showed pretty consistently that a very large number of Americans, and quite often in polls it showed up as a majority, on the issue of single payer at least, have been wanting it for a long time, since the 80s. Even though the polls showed this, it never made it into the public arena and it never made it into public debate. Why? Because this assumption that the state simply follows public opinion has been exceedingly powerful and it's persuasive because there is a logic to saying politicians go after votes. All right, so what's happened is in the last 20 years, this view, which used to be now taken for granted across the political and intellectual spectrum, is taken quite a beating. While it was just the left, which after the 80s became very isolated, uh, very, very uh, small and lack and lost all influence. Well, it was just the left that insisted on the bias towards the rich in social policy. What's happened over the past eight, 10 to 12 years though now is that the state's bias has become acknowledged and in fact admitted not only by mainstream intellectuals, but also by the politicians. And indeed, as always happens, the only reason academics have noticed this and done the research to back it up is because there have been powerful individuals who opened up a space for academics to peep above ground level and take a risk and say, hey, society isn't as fair as we've always made it out to be. Well, what's been these changing circumstances? First of all, the inequalities that have been growing, growing over the past 25, 30 years are now so stark. The misery in which people are living, the incredible unyielding bias of the state is so dramatic that it has resulted in a kind of mass outpouring of revulsion through things like the Occupy movement, through things like uh, the anti-racist movements, and of course, in 2016, most dramatically, Bernie Sanders phenomenon. It was even coming up in Obama's campaigns from 2008 onwards after the Great Recession. That now emboldened academics to finally say what the data has always been showing had they cared to look, which is in public policy, if you look at the influence of the wealthy and the influence of the poor, the actual impact of the views of the poor on policy on a scale of one to 10 is somewhere around zero. Empirically now, there's plenty of research which is showing that in the actual policies that come out of the American state, the correspondence between the policies and the, in, the Preferences of the bottom 30% of the population, that correspondence is zero. The only time it rises above zero is when the preferences of the poor can piggyback on the preferences of the middle class on up. When they come into conflict with what the middle class and on up wants, politicians literally pay no attention to the poor. Now, this is something that the left has always known. It's the mainstream that now is coming. Uh, acknowledge it. That opens up the door for us now to say, this is not an accident. It is in fact built into the capitalist state. And what I want to do now is lay out how and why it's built into the way in which a capitalist state works. 
the first avenue through which the writ, let me back, back up a second. The basic pillar, the basic, the foundation, the take home message for everything I'm about to say is this, this something that is, should be a truism. That's something that's so obvious that only a child would deny it. But it's a, in the recent past, it has been something of a contentious point. It is this, in a capitalist economy, in a capitalist democracy, that is to say a political system that is uh, overlaid on top of a capitalist economy, there is a simple rule. And that rule is economic inequality translates into political inequality. So there is no firewall. There is no filter that separates whatever's going on in the economy with what happens in politics. In fact, they're very tightly linked. So what, if there are inequalities of wealth and income in the economy, they will show up as unequal access, unequal influence in policy as well. Now, that's the basic premise. The channels through which this happens are of two kinds. One is very, very obvious and is repeated by everyone today. And it, I'm gonna rush through it because everyone now, even in the mainstream admits this, thanks to Bernie. The other, I wanna spend a little bit more time on because it's more insidious, it's more important, and it's much harder. Indeed, in capitalism, it's impossible to overturn. So let's start with the first channel. The first one is easy. The politicians that come into office for two very specific reasons are going to always be, unless there's a very special circumstance, inclined to favor the interests of the wealthy. The first such reason is overwhelmingly politicians themselves, who, those who are elected and are successful in their campaigns are from the ranks of the wealthy. More than two thirds of American congressmen were millionaires before they got into office. That means that they themselves come from the class that is trying to influence them. And they have no experience with, no real connection to, nor much sympathy for the vast majority of the American people. Now this is just, Materialism 101, I hesitate to say sociology 101 because God only knows what they teach in sociology, but it's materialism 101. Whatever your social background is, is gonna influence your views, it's gonna influence your values, it's gonna influence your social outcome. If politicians' social origins are overwhelmingly from a tiny stratum of society, their outlook is gonna reflect the outlook of that stratum. And so when they are enjoined to think about public policy to think about what kind of measures they ought to be proposing, their natural outlook is going to be aligned with the outlook of the wealthy. This is true in every capitalist country, on, except in very special circumstances when in particular periods, parties of working with people of working class origin have managed to win elections. But as a rule, politicians either are themselves from the ranks of the capitalist class or orbit around the capitalist class say as lawyers or as some kind of financial advisors or something like that. An addendum to this is this, politicians originate from cap the capitalist class, but it, it's, don't underestimate the importance of the fact that when they exit politics, they exit to join the ranks of either the capitalist or their direct servants. So most in the US, what the recent research has shown is that the incidents, most politicians and their um, advisors or staffers, when they leave office, they become lobbyists for corporations, which means that while they're in office, they can't do anything to piss off the corporation because that they know is their future employer, which means, of course, that the policies that they pass is going to be aligned with the interests of those people. All right, that's one obvious thing. Secondly, of course, is the fact that in an election, in a system like the United States, where elections are privately financed, if you want to get into office, you've got to raise the bucks. Until Bernie Sanders' campaign, which thanks to the internet, was able to draw on the support of millions upon millions upon millions of small donations. Until that happened, the rule, and it's still true today for all non-Bernie politicians, the rule has been, if you wanna be successful, you've gotta to go to where the money is because the money is what allows you to run your campaign in the first place. All right, well, where's the money? It's in the hands of the rich, so you have to go to them. But once you go to them, why are they going to give you the money if they know that once in office, you're going to turn around and kick them in the stomach? So you're going to pass policies that go against their interests. So it is understood if you're going to them for money, that there's going to be a bond of trust between you and them 
that if you get elected, you will return the favor. Not in a crass way where they come with an itemized list, a shopping list of what they want. But generally speaking, you're not going to, if they call you, you're going to answer the phone. If they want to talk to you, you're going to make time for them. And generally speaking, whatever policies you pass, you will try your hardest to make sure they are policies that are more or less acceptable to the people who got you elected. Now, if this is true, two very important implications follow from it. The first one is this, and the person who really did the key work in this is a political scientist named Thomas Ferguson. The implication here that Ferguson um, pointed out was, was important is that there are really two competitions in American politics. Pluralists always pointed to the competition for votes. So remember I said, the pluralist premises, the mainstream premises, what you go after is the largest number of votes and the largest number of votes belong to the poor. So if there's anything that the state is gonna be biased towards, it'll probably be somewhere along the middle or the uh, left end of society. What, to, what Ferguson pointed out and what I'm trying to say here is, is that anterior and antecedent competition that politicians have to compete, uh, participate in before the competition for votes ever gets off the ground. And that's the competition for money. That's the competition for funders. So the people who end up competing for votes first have to be the winners in the competition for funders. Now, what that means is funders essentially have a veto over who gets to compete for votes in the first place at all. If you don't get enough of them to back you, you don't even get to have a campaign. You, don't, you can't hire staff. You can't get advertising. You can't get any, any kind of what's called ground game going. Uh, you don't get off the ground. These wealthy people who fund your campaign see their contribution as investment, and they expect a return on that investment. What that means then is politicians, and this is the first of the two implications I was pointing out, politicians, sorry, this is the second one. The first one was that there's two competitions, not just one. The second implication is politicians do not follow public opinion. Politicians follow elite opinion. The mechanism through which elite opinion exercises its weight on the politicians is this funding process, this crass funding process. If you do not in, make yourself attractive to these people, you don't get through. And that means that when you, as a politician, you're putting your program together, you're putting a platform together as a party, it is not the opinion of the masses. It's the opinion of those people who are making your, your campaign viable at all. And that's the wealth. Now, notice that flips the, the, the script on the mainstream view. Public opinion does not anymore drive politics. It becomes a constraint on politics. It's what politicians now have to navigate. And what they in fact relate, the way in which they in fact relate to public opinion is that they try to manage it. They don't try to seek out what the people want. Well, they, they essentially look at their campaigns as sales campaigns. What they're doing is they have a product. The product is what the elites want. And they have to figure out a way of getting it through the market. And the way you do it is you find a way of packaging it so that either you present that agenda as an agenda that's going to benefit the masses, even when it won't, or more importantly, more commonly, you steer away from the key issues. You try to make the political battle the one that comes out into the media, the one that the public actually gets to participate in, you try to make that debate, a debate in which the key issues that capital actually worries about and that has a stake in are never in fact debated at all. You just keep those off the table because what you're trying to do is keep the public at bay so that whatever influence they have, whatever constraints they impose on you, don't touch the essence of the matter which is, what is it that my funders want me to do? Public opinion, therefore, in a radical or a Marxist or a socialist view of the state is not the driver of public policy. It is the constraint that has to be managed. And politicians in the state view public opinion as something that they have to coordinate and control rather than seek out and follow. All right. That is absolutely crucial then for the 
Marxist understanding of what the state is. Now, everything I've said so far comes from one channel. Remember I said there were two channels. This channel is the way in which, poly, in which the wealthy use, I'm sorry to use this pretentious academic language, but sometimes we need to do it. They use their agency. They actually go out and try to have an impact on the world. They, they exercise their influence consciously and actively. They call up politicians or the, they themselves become politicians and they try to then shape policy. That's one channel. Interpersonal connections, social origins, threats, uh, 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 intimidation, not physical, but economic intimidation, et cetera. There's a second channel, which is not talked about, even in left-wing media. You know, even if you watch the fantastic show called The Rising, or if you watch the left-wing podcasts, 98% of everything they talk about is the money. Who's paying whom? Who's funding whom? Who seeks to gain influence? Who seeks to peddle influence? Things like that. That's all channel one, the first channel. The second channel, more important one, is this. A capitalist economy is set up, and a capitalist state on top of that economy is set up in such a way that even if capitalists stay at home, don't make a single phone call, don't try to intimidate any of the politicians, don't call in favors, don't threaten with rescinding funding from the next election, even if they do none of that, they still end up being the number one priority on every politician's list. And they still, therefore, end up being the favored group that the state is catering to. And why is that? How could that be? It's because capitalists control the goose that lays the golden eggs. Because they control the means of production, capitalists have their hand, I'm changing metaphors here, on the spigot, on the faucet, out of which all income and all wealth flows, which is investment. Every politician knows that if he gets elected into office and he presides over a economic slowdown, a recession, or even worse, a depression, so that voters are getting losing their jobs, unemployment is rising, it's not the capitalists who are blamed for this. It's the, it's the politicians. And one of the best predictors of who wins a presidential election in the United States, one of the best predictors is what's the state of the economy eight or 10 months before the election. The best predictor of the incumbent losing office is if there's a recession or an economic slowdown. Well, what causes economic slowdown? It's a slowing down of investment. Now, politicians, when they look out into the world and they see, a, sorry, not politicians, capitalists, when they look out into the world and they see a new party or a new candidate gaining office, what they make a judgment about is this, I'm about to make an investment. It's going to take years and years to pay out. It takes time for your money to come back to you, especially in large investments. What's the climate, the environment going to look like two years, three years, four years from now, or even six months from now? If that environment is going to be one in which I think my investments are going to be imperiled in some way, because this politician is suddenly going to attack private property or empower unions, or put up trade barriers, then the prudent thing for me to do, even if I don't call him, no phone calls, no lobbying, the prudent thing for me to do is to hold back on my investment activity. But of course, if you hold back on your investment activity, it's an economic slowdown. They all do it atomistically. They all do it individually. And the economic slowdown means you're the politicians out of office. So any party that gets into office, the first thing it does is it has to ask itself, how do we maintain a climate in which growth is healthy, investment is going on, et cetera, et cetera? The way they maintain it is assuring the people who control investment that they don't pose a threat. All parties are subject to this discipline, and all parties have to prioritize capitalist interests. Otherwise, they're out, whether you're left wing or you're right wing. Underneath all the bluster, the lobbying, the, the social influence, and all that is this brute fact. And every political party that gets into office knows that. And this is why they start backtracking from any promises they might have made. So this second channel cements and reinforces all the advantages that capitalists have through their lobbying, through their electoral funding, et cetera. It reinforces it. And it, it ensures that when they get into office, no matter what else is happening, 
politicians not only are sensitive to what the wealthy want, they actively seek out the opinions and the priorities of the wealthy, even if the wealthy are sitting back at home and watching TV. That's all it takes. These two channels then together combine to instill within the state a bias towards the controllers of investment and the holders of wealth, regardless of what else is happening in the political process. That's what makes the state a capitalist state. So the common sense, the brute experience that people on the left have had over 150 years, in which every time they try to get something done for the poor, they meet up with resistance from the state, even if the state is manned by people who seem to be friendly to them. The way you explain it is through these very dis distinct mechan mechanisms, one of which depends on the, in the peddling of income inequality, and the other of which is based on the underlying wealth and asset inequality. And as I said earlier, this, the influence, the advantages that capitalists have because of their control of the means of production means every state in capitalism, as long as it's presiding over capitalism, always and everywhere will favor the wealthy, always and everywhere. All that changes from country to country is the degree to which capitalists have priority. In a country like Sweden or Bernie's favorite country, Denmark, you still have a prioritization of capitalist interest. It's just more muted. It's less uh, amplified than in a country like the US where they just rule the roost. These are two forms, two degrees of capitalist prioritization. And this is why when critics say Bernie, when he's pushing for De Denmark to be our model, is not a socialist, in this very narrow sense, that's right. Denmark is a capitalist country. It's just a capitalist country in which the rule of capital has been muted relative to that of the US. All right, well, that's the source then of capitalist power in the state. And that answers the question, why doesn't the state intervene on the side of the poor? The question that we started with. We now close then with the following, a puzzle, which is, if what I've said is true, it paints a picture that's so stark, that's so bleak, that first of all, it wants to make you throw up your hands and go, well, there's nothing we can do. But more importantly, it also seems inconsistent with what we've seen over the past hundred years. It is, of course, true, as I said, whenever the poor try to do anything to better their situation, the state tends to come down on the side of the rich. But it's also true that over the past hundred years or so, there has been wave after wave of social reform. There's been wave after wave of instances in which social policy, economic policy, in fact, turned toward the poor, not against the rich, but simply became less overtly favorable to the rich. Well, how could this happen is what, I, if what I've said is all there is to it. Well, it happened because what I've said is not all there is to it. But what I've said enables us to understand the very specific conditions in which the poor might actually be able to counter in some way the influence of the wealthy. How do they do it? Well, it follows logically from what I just said. I said, the reason the wealthy are able to exercise their influence is that in essence, they are able to have wield a threat over politicians. And there's two such threats. One is a direct threat, which is you don't do what I say, I don't fund your campaigns. You don't do what I say, I give the money to somebody else. The other is an indirect threat. And this is the more important one, which is if you don't cater to our interests, we will weaken the conditions that allow you to be a successful politician because we will weaken the economy. In essence, what they're saying is we have the power to disrupt the economy if we don't get what we want. So labor now, when it seeks to change the direction of policy, no matter how much it begs and pleads, no matter how much it has, has petitions that are signed or has wonderful commercial, it's not going to be able to influence politicians unless it has some leverage actual power behind what it's demanding. Now, if the essence of capitalist power is their ability to wage, wield economic disruption, the most effective means of countering that is for the other side to have some power of economic disruption of its own. Because what that does is it makes capitalists less inclined to dig in their heels and say to their political servants in the state, you don't give them anything. You don't pass a single policy. You don't do anything to, that might uh, deprioritize what we want. 
if you can exercise sufficient leverage, capitalists can in fact say, hey man, we better give them something because there's the disruption that's going on is getting in the way of our making profit. So what is this economic disruption? There's only one agency that can wield the kind of disruption that can engage in the sorts of activities that actually bring capitalists to the table in politics. And that's people who work, the working class, for the simple reason that whatever wealth the capitalists are producing for themselves comes out of the cooperation, the everyday laboring activities of workers. And it's when workers go beyond simply petition signing and voting at the booth, and they start threatening economic disruption through strikes, through mass organizing, that's when the very mechanism that ensure the state's complicity and compliance with capitalist interests, those very mechanisms, which is the way in which wealth is produced, now enable the poor to have a countervailing power of their own. Because capitalists now have to themselves worry about what the poor want so that they can bring the strikes to a halt, so they can have labor peace, and through that, recommence with their profiting and recommence with their um, survival as economic actors. In other words, then, the way in which the class bias of the state is reduced is by the other class in a capitalist society, that is labor, organizing itself and posing a threat to capital. Notice, not a threat to the state directly, but a threat to capital first. Because you can threaten a politician, I'm not going to vote for you. I'm going to take away 100,000 votes. Now, that's not trivial. If you can do that, that's something. But once the election is over, you all go back home and there's four years before the next election. In those four years, you just quit the field. The field is now open to the, the capitalist to pick up the phone and say, here's what I want you to do. Or for the politician to pick up the phone and say to the capitalist, hey, the elections are over, what do you want me to do? In between, outside of the ballot box, outside of the electoral arena, you must have a power of your own. And that's a power in the real root of a capitalist economy, which is the workplace. We'll go into this again on Friday more deeply. This is why labor matters more than any other actor in a capitalist society, because it is the only actor that can actually make capitalists listen, that can actually instill fear in their hearts. So therefore, the way from, to go from a country like the US which, in which capitalists ruled roost and policy unilaterally favors them to the point where the poor exercise zero influence to get to a Denmark or a Sweden in which capitalists have to now account for the interests of the poor, even though they're still the stronger party. The way to get there everywhere, in every single instance, has been through the organized power of working people. Yes, brown, black, male, and female. This thing on the left that if you say working class, you must mean white men. I don't want to get into it, but it is a form of mental retardation. We're talking about people of all stripes and all colors, as long as they are working people, right? So the essence then to reducing the class bias of the state is class struggle. And so we have a very neat theory. The source of the class, the bias of the state, the class bias of the state is class power the power that capitalists wield in the economy. And the road to social reform is through the organized power of the other class, which is labor. Elections play a role in this, and we can get into that in question and answers, but they are not the road to power. They are merely an expression of the accumulating power of the working class or an expression of the unalloyed hegemony of capital. They themselves do not and typically cannot change the balance of power. They are an expression of that balance of power. This is what you'll have to convince your liberal friends of. I'll stop there. Thank you, Vivek. That was great. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, this is the second of three lectures that Vivek is doing. Um, there's one more on Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And Vivek also, loosely, these structures are, are based on a set of pamphlets that he wrote for us in 20. 18, and that we publish in conjunction with Catalyst, the journal he edits, uh, the ABCs of capitalism. And those pamphlets are now available for free in its digital version. If you go to bit.ly slash ABCs of capitalism, 
bit.ly slash ABCs of Capitalism. If you go to the YouTube um, description, you'll see a link for it there too. There's a lot of questions. Many of them are good questions, but they're kind of like a Vivek Chibber ask me anything. It's a bit, um, you know, I want to I want to stick and prioritize the questions that are particularly on on the the topic of capitals in the state because I imagine a lot of the other questions will get addressed on Friday. It's it's exciting. Yeah, Oscar, uh, in your job as intermediary, what you should do is for now, I'll beg the listeners' indulgence, screen out questions that are more appropriate and will be more easily answered in lecture three. Yes, and yes. People just have to be patient. Yes, it's it's like uh, it's it's this is. The uh, lecture three is going to be Return of the Jedi, but actually not terrible. It'll be a thrilling, great conclusion. It'll be, you know, excellent. You think of the Godfather series because I don't. I think was, there I was, was gonna. I was gonna. I was gonna say the Godfather, but but Godfather three was just so so awful. I just watched it for the first time. It was. It was yeah, not we'll good. Have, the third lecture will be Godfather two point eight two A. Yes, definitely. Um, Fredo's so, Revenge. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, Let's see. Let me let me get to, here's here's one good question that that is on 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 the topic and it's from H.S. Ross. Is there clear empirical evidence of capitals withholding investment or credibly threatening it to oppose or discipline potential left candidates? Okay, that's it's easier. But he follows it up with, "Don't capitalists face a collective action problem in organizing an investment boycott of a left candidate? How do they solve it? And I guess uh, what role does the state uh, play in this?" Yeah, very good question. As for the first one, yeah, there is clear empirical evidence. There are episodes in which we know capitalists, in fact, withheld investment. And there are many more episodes of capitalists threatening or their representatives warning of the possibility of withholding investment, which chastens capital, uh, politicians. The reason it chastens them is because they're aware that there is a reality in which capitalists have done this in the past. OK, what are some instances where they've done it in the past? I'll just give you two or three. The most famous one, of course, was Chile in 1973, when prior to the coup, there was a quite well-organized investment strike in Chile to topple the Allende regime. That's pretty well known. Another, uh, the book that my first book was on um, the uh, origins of the post-colonial state in India, when there was a very powerful thrust to have the state be kind of a social democratic planning regime. And if you read that book, I hate to, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, promote my own work. But if you read that book, I give a quite detailed story about how the Indian capitalist class, in fact, uh, generated an investment strike to bring the Indian National Congress to its knees, which was uh, quite successful. Uh, in Egypt, when Nasser, in, uh, when he first came to power, moved against the Egyptian bourgeoisie, it was in the face of an investment strike. Uh, and in the 1930s, there are known instances of investment strikes as well, which is one of the reasons why uh, the social democratic parties had such a difficult time in certain key countries. Then there is the threat of investment strikes. There's a very good recent paper by Michael Schwartz in Politics and Society with some co-authors laying out how when Obama comes to power in 2008, there was all sorts of threats being made. I mean, not that they needed to do it. Obama was the most willing servant to capital that we've seen from the Democratic Party in at least 60 years. But there were all sorts of threats uh, being made in the business press and directly uh, by uh, capitalists themselves that if there was any whisper of anything like a single payer plan or a national health care plan, it would result in what they call economic disaster. At the time, I remember uh, the, um, the uh, Financial Times wrote editorial after editorial warning of the importance of the what they call the investment climate. Investment climate is a code word for saying the sentiments of the capitalist class. And like I said, they, he didn't have to do it, but it, it was a disciplining mechanism for him. When Bill Clinton came to power in 1992, he had that famous quote, which you read in Bob Woodward's book on his first 100 days, in which Clinton at that time had a plan to have an $80 billion uh, industrial policy, 80 billion is a pittance, but for you know, the height of Reaganism at the time, and Clinton as the flag bearer of Reaganism inside the Democratic Party had to be sensitive to this. The, his advisors told him, if you try to do anything like this, there's going to be an attack on the dollar. And Clinton famously said, you mean I owe my presidency to a bunch of fucking bond traders? So this was a fear of a kind of economic attack 
on his presidency, not identical to an investment strike, but a close cousin to an investment strike. So yeah, if it wasn't true, these guys wouldn't be paying attention to it. They wouldn't be doing it, and it is true. Oh, I'm sorry, the second question. You're absolutely right about the collective action problem. This is why investment strikes don't happen every day. See, when a, when a capitalist withholds investment, what he's actually doing is creating an opportunity for his competitors to come in and eat his markets, to encroach on his markets. So investment strikes only occur when the stakes are so large mm -hmm. that the class as a whole, or very, very large swaths of the class, come together and they say, look, let's have a, a kind of agreement amongst ourselves. So they, they oftentimes do have to be organized, even though in principle, this need not be the case. So, so they have to be organized so that they don't encroach on it. And that is, as you say, a collective action problem. So in, let's say, a place like Sweden in the 1970s, they had a very large employer federation that was almost a mirror image of the LO, and they were doing this coordination and, and disciplining. And I, and I imagine in various ways, chamber of commerces and similar you know, um, formations can, uh, can do that. But let's say in a place like France, you know the, the, the history of, of, of this in, in, in France far better than me, but wasn't just simply businesses looking around and saying, this investment climate looks really bad, the economic yeah. uh, economy that, looks that, really bad, and yeah, the meter on, getting it, too strong. So, so you're talking about the, the Mitterrand government mm -hmm. in the first two years of Mitterrand. Uh, that Mitterrand comes to power, and uh, yes, it's a French name, and I have no, I, no idea of how to pronounce it. So just, no, that's right. I think, I don't know. There's something to do with the R, which I don't know. I don't know why they use, they should have a different letter. I don't know well, why I, I call the publication Jacobin. So, you know, we've given up on French pronunciations a long time but, ago. Well, they deserve it. Yeah. Who was the last good French philosopher anyway? The, um, the Mitterrand government's first two years, it, it, it came to a complete collapse, not because of an organized attack uh, on uh, the currency, but because of enormous capital flight, which was all uncoordinated. So, okay, let's see. Let me scroll through these comments. Oh, Randy Greer says, uh, Slava Zizek, I don't always understand, but I understand this guy. I'm like, yes, of course, because Vivek doesn't get loaded up on like cocaine and quote Lacan and, and talk about, you know, he did talk about Star Wars, but you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a low bar. I think we should, he deserves higher praise for these lectures than that. Um, okay, so there are a lot of questions that are referring to particular debates that I think you did a good job not addressing because you just presented a very clear view of the of um, the nature Oscar, of the state. We should steer clear of those debates because these will be questions coming from grad students or people in seminars and that's fine, but I think I'm, we should be trying to reach a wider audience. They're gonna be very narrow debates. Well. So I, I won't I won't even mention the the P word or the M word, but okay, what, good, I, what good, I will good. say is this: like, can you describe to what extent the welfare state was was or is a challenge to to the traditional Marxist conception of of of, of the state? Uh, so, for example, um, I don't know. I'll let you just take it from yeah, there. Yeah, uh, the answer is zero. Mm -hmm. if, if you listen carefully to the lecture. So here's one way in which people think the welfare state might be a challenge. And I, I, I might be misreading the, um, the premise of the question because there are a variety of ways in which you could say the welfare state is a challenge to Marxist understanding. But the typical one is, well, Marxists say the state is the servant of the bourgeoisie. And look, the welfare state's doing all kinds of nice things for the poor. How could this be possible if it's a servant of the bourgeoisie? If that's where the question's coming from, the answer is already in the lecture, which is it comes out of class struggle. And you have a clear, this is why the theory is not a tautology or a series of truisms, because you can generate falsifiable propositions. The falsifiable proposition is this, you won't see significant shifts in social policy towards the poor unless it's pushed by, through some sort of organizing activity of the poor. Public opinion by itself can at times generate some shift, but it's going to be quite small. A second prediction is, as the power of labor wanes, either through the destruction of trade unions or through the subordination of trade unions and their domestication, as the threat of economic disruption wanes, you should see policy shifting back towards a more obvious pro-capitalist um, tendency. Both of those propositions are 
I think, resoundingly confirmed in the history of the welfare state. All of the Western welfare states were born out of class struggle. And the decline of the welfare state has been very, very closely uh, linked to the decline of the, the economic disruptive power of the working class. So there's a question that, that came in that I might be be misinterpreting, but I'll, I'll just read it verbatim actually, and you and you could you could interpret it. Um, it might be nice to touch on how we understand the capital state when it comes to international relations. There is no theory. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole stable of something called Marxist international relations theorists, but they have yet to produce anything that I would call a theory. It's a lot of very elaborate discussion, uh, uh, elaborate description with a lot of name dropping and bells and whistles. But I, I, in my view, there is no consistent theory of international relations coming out of the Marxist theory of the state that goes beyond some very obvious and white, very shallow, I think, proposition. Uh, but basically, we can say this, a capitalist state will try to preserve the interests of its capitalist class in the international domain, much the same as it tries to preserve them in the domestic domain. Secondly, that the ability of capitalist states to do so is differentially distributed. Mm -hmm. And this is where the hierarchy of nation states becomes important. There are only a few capitalist states at any given time that not only have the ability to defend their own capitalists' interests, but also to impose their capitalists' interests and preferences on other states. When that happens, we usually call it imperialism. Um, now, this is recognized not only by Marxists, truth is it's recognized by the realist school as well, and the important strands within the realist school, which is a mainstream school. Uh, and what is useful in it is not the theory and the theoretical proposition that come out of it, because they're pretty shallow and pretty obvious, I think. What's useful is that it's able to illuminate and guide very rich empirical research. And the real, in my view, uh, contributions that left-wing Marxist uh, political economists have made in international relations is not theoretical, it's more empirical. So Evan George has a great question that I'm going to actually save and table until Friday. I'll skip to one from Kevin, which is, well, this is something that I don't think will be addressed tomorrow. So even though it's slightly off topic, uh, I, I think many people would, would want to hear your, your response. Um, you use the word middle cl class in your, in your, your talk. Um, I've generally viewed the questioner asked that category as referring to the better paid working class as well as some other strata and used less by Marxists. Can you explain it? You, you actually do this very well in your, your big class at, at NYU. So I, I was wondering, I, I think people would be interested in hearing your, your response to a condensed yeah. version of the problem of the middle class. The, um, when I use the term middle class in a lecture such as this, I'm using it uh, in a very loose term and loose sense. And what I mean by it really is uh, two things. One is what everybody on the left these days talks about the professional managerial class. It's not a class, but what you guys, it's a stratum, but that's okay. Well, when all you youths, when you talk about the professional managerial class, uh, that is one section of the middle class that I have in mind, which is salaried people, um, professors, uh, engineers, things like that. Uh, and of course, the other that I have in mind is, is the traditional middle class, which is people who are neither exploiter nor exploited, owner operators, you know, shopkeepers and things like that. I do not mean, I do not mean, although, much of what I'm saying could be consistent with it if I did mean it. I do not mean very well-paid workers. Uh, I don't mean that. What I mean is people who, my teacher Eric Wright would have said, people who are in contradictory class location, who are somewhere in between workers and capitalists. Uh, workers and capitalists. That's a. I'm sorry. That's a probably no, too no. deviated an answer. No, no. I, th I think. I think. I think that's that's great. And those. I mean, there. Eric Cohen Wright has has a few great. Great, um, great essays on it, and I think people can can dive into the question question there. But I think that's a good starting point. Um, there's a question from Jeff: To what extent does the traditional? I'm oh, sorry. To what extent does the neoliberal capitalist state differ from the traditional capitalist state, and is it less stable? Well, if by traditional capitalist state we mean the state that preceded the welfare state, it is a closer approximation to that institutional variant of the bourgeois state than the welfare state. 
the neoliberal state should be thought of in two ways. One is its aspirations, and the second is its reality. In its aspirations, the people behind it are very clear. They want to return to the pre-social democratic, pre-welfare state. That's the welfare state of the Victorian era and the Edwardian era. As an aspiration, aspiratorially, write that down, that's a new word. And now I'm Zizek. Uh, as an aspiration, it is very much uh, like the traditional capitalist state. Now, it is true that the reality is the ability of neo neoliberal politicians and their bourgeois masters to in fact roll back the welfare state has been differentially distributed. And as I said earlier, the prediction is I think well borne out by the facts, which is if you look at the landscape of bourgeois states right now, the welfare states, it maps pretty well onto the actual balance of class power. In the countries where labor has been successfully domesticated or its institutions dismantled, you see a quite um, stark return to the principles and the institutions of the pre-welfare state era. And in the countries where labor still has some muscle, it's more of an aspiration and less of a reality. But the tendency across these states in the neoliberal era has been quite uniform as a tendency in which there are differential distributions of outcomes. So Christopher and Courtney, your question is another one that along with that Evan George question, I'm going to table until Friday. Hopefully we can get to it on on on, on Friday. Um, well, I think we'll just take one or two more more questions uh, and then we'll we'll leave kind of some of the big unanswered questions till the, the Friday lecture, which again is at, at 6 p.m. on Friday. Um, one question about the EU slash Eurozone uh, from Sam. Some Marxist economists say that unifying nation states into both um, uh, into a monetary and fiscal union cannot happen in a full and harmonious way under capitalism. Why is that? I guess you could take that question broadly to, to Wait, think about. Well, are, is it why do Marxists say that? Or is it that why is it in fact the case that you can't bring them together harmoniously? Well, why is it? Let's start with why is it in fact the case? It's not the, in fact yeah. the case. It's not. Look. Um, there are a lot of papers out there by economists, uh, some of whom are on the left, that look at the American experience as a successful case of individual economic units, let's call them states, being brought together into a United States of America, in which you have to figure out a way of generating a mechanism that harmonizes these interests. In principle, in principle, there's no reason why you can't have a United States of Europe if what we're talking about is interests of European capital being harmonized, I don't see any reason why that can't be done. What I do believe is not going to be possible is that a state such as that is also in the favor of the European working class. So I'm one of those people who says the project of a new Europe as presently constituted is an anti-working class project. I don't see any way that the EU as presently constituted, can ever be consistent with a social democratic project. It was designed to push such an eventuality off the table. Now, that's simply saying the following, that the a, a United States of Europe is possible if we take the interests of European capital and their harmonization. For a United States of Europe to be a social democratic project, it'll have to be redone from the bottom up because it'll have to be a project in which, just like within one nation state, in which labor plays a key role in fashioning it. And the, if you can, it's right out there, if anybody cares to read it, the history of the EU was one in which it was technocrats and neoliberalizing parties whose conception of a social, any kind of social contract was an ordo-liberal conception. They were the ones who designed it. So I think that's a great place to uh, to end it. Uh, again, there was a lot of other questions that I'm going to take and we'll use on on Friday. Maybe we'll have a slightly longer one on, yeah, I'm happy on to Friday. I'm happy for it to be a longer set. I actually took about six or eight minutes more today than I thought I would. Um, I apologize. But I'm happy to go on longer on Friday because, you know, we're now touching on the most important questions in modern society. And, um, I, you know, I feel bad about, about not being able to take more of those questions. So without further ado, I think we'll wrap up there. Remember 6 p.m. on Friday, please tune in.
and uh, check out Catalyst. Also, Vivek uh, mentioned uh, uh, quite bashfully uh, his, his first book, which I do recommend everyone check out, Locked in Place, because it gives a good sense of the project of state building uh, in, in India, as well as, as uh, a comparative look at, at South Korea. And that sounds incredibly dry and boring. It is not as bad as it would seem. It's very accessible. Uh, That's I, the endorsement I was looking for. Yeah. I, I really go for books that are not as bad as they might seem. You know, it was, it's, it, it, it's a very good, it's a very good book. Uh, check, check that out. Uh, read and subscribe to Catalyst. Uh, Vivek and I are both working this week on, on finishing up, uh, the, the issue it's, it's one of the stronger ones and, uh, please, uh, tune in on, on Friday, press like, and subscribe, get a copy of ABCs of capitalism in the, uh, in the, uh, comments, uh, in the description. And uh, I'll see you on, on Friday. Thanks again, Vivek. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming.